Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation about fantastic exoplanets and how to find them. Today, I'm going to guide you through the most important uh, background on exoplanet science. And in the end, I hope you have a better understanding on what we currently know about, our, uh, about exoplanets in our universe and how we actually derive this knowledge and where do we get it from. So, to start, I give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk today. Uh, first, I will talk to you about um, the origin of stars and planets. Then I will show you a little bit more on how do we actually detect exoplanets, because, as you might already thought, it is a little harder than to just look through a telescope and see them there. Um, then I will talk to you about the type of exoplanets that we already know of. And lastly, I will give you an overview of life on other planets because I figure that is one of the topics that people are most interested in when hearing about exoplanets. So I want to give you a good overview of what we already know about exoplanets and how we derive further knowledge from here. So let's start at the very beginning, at the origin of stars and planets. And here we have this beautiful overview of the different stages that are necessary to, bore, to, to give birth to a solar system like ours. You can see here five different stages, and I will show you some uh, real images of all of those five stages in a second. But you can already see kind of the cycle that goes through. So we start with um, a very light cloud a, very, uh, a cloud that is not dense at all, which then slowly collapses to a more dense material. It collapses then even further to a really thick cloud where stars can be born in, which then evolves further into a disk in which planets can be born in. And then after everything gets cleaned up, we are left with um, a planetary system, including its host star. And of course, there is a cycle, so at one point the star in the middle will burn out, it will die, and it will give its material back to the universe from which new stars and new planets can be born. So now, of course, the pictures you see here are just um, abstract, they are artists' impression, but we can see all of those in our night sky. So let's start with the least dense one, which is basically just the material that is within our galaxy. And that material is everywhere. So it fills our galaxy, and thus we can actually see it at the night sky. If you look here, that's an image of the Milky Way, of our galaxy, which we are in. And you can see it is very bright. We have many different little spots uh, all over the sky. But what I want you to focus on is actually the dark parts, the, the things we don't see. Because that is actually the dust and the material in our galaxy that is just floating around and it waits to collapse and form stars. So this very first stage, we can actually see by eye. If you ever, uh, if you ever are fortunate enough to go in a very dark place, like where there's not a lot of light pollution, and you look up at the sky, there's a good chance that you actually will see the Milky Way and you actually will see this dust around. Now, the next stage is where it collapses a little bit more, so it becomes a little denser, and we actually have a region um, of star formation, or it's going to be a region of star formation, depending on the age of it. Now here you can see the region which has the beautiful name N11, as uh, many of those astrophysical uh, objects have very nice, uh, catchy names. And you can see already here, it looks denser, it looks more compact to each other. And if you look very closely, you can also see like there's some very bright stars in there, so there's already star formation going on. But what this picture should uh, illustrate is kind of the cloud around it, so everything that is around. Now the next stage is then when it collapses further and actually builds a very thick cloud. And here I'm fortunate enough to show you one of my favorite images uh, in astrophysics, which some of you might know. Um, those are called the pillars of creation. 
and they are within the, the Orion star sign. So if you ever look um, at Orion, uh, if you know where to find it in the sky, and look at his belt, right beneath its belt you can actually see um, a whole region where stars are currently born. And this is one of those images taken, like a very small part of it uh, photographed. And what you can see here actually are like those dense clouds that are already so much collapsed that they are uh, optically thick, so you can really uh, see them quite quite clearly, whereas the image before was much more, yeah, much more lighter. You can see much better through it. So in here, in those dust regions, there's actually stars being born right at this very moment. Of course, um, those processes take thousands and millions of years to evolve uh, the stars um, before they're actually then uh, can be seen. Now, the next step of this is when actually the, the star is already quite, uh, quite advanced and the dust collapses into a disk. And here, unfortunately, I don't have a beautiful image, but I have a very scientific image, which uh, is also a beauty in its own. So what you can see here is the, the circumstellar disk of PDS-70, um, where you can see the ring around it is kind of the dust as it was observed by a telescope. And what I really love about this image, you can see a little bright dot there uh, to the side, um, which, by the way, I forgot to mention, the star in this whole uh, picture is in the middle, of course, and it's blocked out. Because if you would not block out the star, everything you would see would just be overshadowed by the brightness of the star, so we need to remove that. But a little bit to the side, you can see a brighter dot, and that is actually... Um, planet formation as it's going on right now. So we can really see planets being born with our current technology, which I personally found incredibly fascinating that we are already at a step um, where we can actually see those and don't just need to rely on artists' impressions. Now, the last step is maybe the one we are most used to because it is where our current um, solar system is at, and that is having a perfectly fine uh, arrangement of a star and planets around it. But also here, we are very fortunate to live in a time and age where we have satellites who can go to those planets and deliver those beautiful images, which I think could not have been drawn more beautiful if someone would try to imagine them and draw whatever they think they would look like, because their complexity and their um, Everything about them is so complex that we are still at the beginning to learn them, and you can, we can learn a lot from those images. So this gives you a general overview, the stages that we go from a dusty cloud with not much there, which then collapses until we actually have stars and planets. And this process happens all over uh, in our galaxy. Uh, times and times again, so there are always stars being born, stars dying, and it's a, it's a cycle of formation and destruction. Good. But now the real question. I mean, it's nice to know how things, what are things out there, and it's nice to uh, imagine how they go through the cycles, but of course, um, we want to see more than just the eight planets in our system that we know. Of course, we want to go out and discover the huge variety of exoplanets that are out there. And for this, we first and foremost need very good instrumentation. Um, you can imagine, it's no coincidence that, uh, during the, that exoplanets really started to be a field of research in the last, uh, what is it now, 30, 40 years. Because before that, we simply did not have the technology to, to observe them. I mean, Galileo and all the other uh, astonishing uh, astrophysicists in their time, it was not their lack of trying to find them, it was more that they didn't have the instrumentation to do so. And we are fortunate enough to have. So what you can see here is a summary which just quickly states uh, some very important uh, satellite missions for exoplanet detection. Um, and let's start to the left. We have the ground-based observation, which are not satellites. These are telescopes that are built here on Earth and that look up the sky and try to find planets. And there are many of them out there. Um, each of them is very specialized in their own way to find exoplanets. And I will talk uh, shortly. I will explain to you a little bit in more detail 
how they actually work and how we actually find those. Now to the right, you may or may not recognize some names. Um, if you uh, were ever interested in, uh, uh, in astrophysics and in data gathering uh, from astronomy, then Hubble is a very big name. You probably have heard of it. It's up there for a very long time and it has done some amazing science in its lifetime. Then another one you might recognize is the Kepler, if you're very interested in exoplanets, because Kepler has found thousands of exoplanets in a very narrow field. And it was kind of a revelation that we first learned. I mean, we might suspected it before, but with Kepler, we now know that exoplanets are very common in our galaxy and that we can find them basically everywhere we're looking at. Now, the other Gaia is actually more for stars. It was uh, meant to... Um, yeah, characterize stars much better, but it can also be used to search for exoplanets. Now we can see there are some more. There's TESS Keops, which um, are either trying to find or characterize exoplanets, and there are also some planned mission. Some of you might heard of uh, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which, I, uh, which yeah, has its ups and downs, but we are very much looking forward to its launch because it is... Um, a next stage instrument like with with it we can really push new boundaries we can really go further than we have ever been before um, and hopefully we will gather uh, uh, information about exoplanets about stars and about our universe in general that we will have not known before um, james webb is a enormous project um, with billions of dollars going into um, but there are also some smaller projects, in quotations, since they're still very expensive. There's Plato and uh, Ariel coming up, which both are there to um, either characterize or find. I think both of them are actually there mostly to characterize exoplanets, we already know. But in theory, they could also be used to find new exoplanets. Now, I think, yes, of course, uh, this would not be a good presentation without some images of JWST, because... Um, it is just an astonishing instrument. You can see on the left side, um, you can see its main mirror and the people around it. Now, it is always a little bit hard if you have never seen like this telescope to put that into perspective, but that thing is huge considering that we have to put it on a rocket and shoot it into outer space. Now, I think every one of you is aware that Shooting things into outer space is a very dangerous and very complicated process. So building this enormous telescope and actually being able to launch it um, into orbit and more precisely into a, a Lagrangian point where it will uh, start uh, to work and start observing is a, huge, uh, on the t uh, is a huge effort of many, many people. So yeah, on the left you can see kind of a size comparison, how big it is. And on the right, you, uh, you see kind of an artist's impression, how it will look like floating into space and uh, doing the observations. Okay, so now I kept you waiting long enough. Let's get into the really interesting part. How do we actually find exoplanets? How do we go from those telescopes to we know there are other planets, so we know that they're, uh, that they're out there? Um, and I'm going to talk about the three main detection methods. And let's start with the first one, which is radial velocity measurement. That was used to discover the first uh, ever exoplanet and has since been used uh, many times to discover new planets. And how it works is actually, let, let me start with an analogy. I mean, all of us know the effect when an, uh, an ambulance or a fire truck uh, drives by. You heard first hear that high-pitched, um, fast uh, frequency of the sirens, and as soon as it passed you, it gets lower um, and uh, slower. So, now imagine you are at the roundabout, and for whatever reason, an ambulance just drives around this roundabout all the time. So every time it passes you, you first hear it very, uh, very fast. As soon as it passes you, the sirens become slower. Now, on the other side of the roundabout, you have the opposite. It's first um, slower and then becomes faster again. And if it drives around, you always have this cycle of being, uh, being higher, then being lower again, being higher again, being lower, and you have kind of as an oscillation of those two things. Now, we can use exactly the same trick to discover exoplanets around stars. But instead of looking at sound waves, because they cannot really travel in our, uh, in our galaxy, we're looking at light waves. So we're looking at the light of the uh, that from the star comes to us, 
And that is one very important fact. We do not look at the planet directly. We only look at the star and how the star does exactly this, uh, this effect that the ambulance does, where the light first becomes a little bit faster, um, so the frequency of the light in that case goes a little bit higher, and then the frequency goes a little bit lower. So that basically corresponds to a shift in color. So first we shift it blue, so the whole star becomes bluer, and then we shift it red, so the whole star becomes redder. And we can actually measure those color differences. Now, how it probably would look like, we can see here in this artist's impression, where you see the star in the middle, you see an exoplanet around it, uh, and they both rotate around the center of mass. Now, of course, the star is much heavier than the planet, but the planet is, has, still has a considerable mass. And you can see there's a slight offset. So the star doesn't rotate around its center itself, but it rather rotates around the combined center of those two objects. Now, if you would be from the side and look at that, we actually have that. Now, you can imagine again, now we were in the helicopter over the roundabout, and we just see the, the ambulance driving circles around the, uh, around the roundabout, and that is basically what is illustrated here. So if you would look from the side, we would again, uh, would, if we would be standing on the side, we would have exactly the effect as I described it before, with first it being faster, and then slower, and faster, slower. And in stellar terms, that means it first becomes bluer, then becomes redder, it becomes bluer again, and so on. And this tells us a lot about the exoplanet, mostly about its mass, how heavy it is, because the more heavy it is, the stronger the star um, uh, oscillates. But we can also, um, yeah. So that is a very nice way to actually find exoplanets. And it was one of the first, it was the first way we actually discovered an exoplanet around another star. So to the, from the first method, we go to maybe the most uh, successful one in terms of it has brought us the most exoplanets. And that is called transit. Uh, or if you, if you go a little bit fancier, transit photometry, where we can also do um, other stuff with. So what happens here is, and let me quickly just skip to the next slide where we have uh, those nice illustrations again. So you already get kind of a feeling because I think it illustrates it very well. So what we do with transits, we have planets rotating around other stars. We know that. And if you ever have seen a solar eclipse, you know that if as for some reason a body goes in front of the sun, it becomes dark. So the same happens, for example, um, or we can observe on Earth with Mercury. If we look at the sun and you have like, please don't look with your eyes, it's very dangerous. But if you have like the right instrumentations and look at the sun, we can see Mercury passing in front of the sun and we can see its shadow, which looks very much, uh, maybe not in size. Mercury, I think, is a little bit smaller than that. But in theory, it looks very similar to what you can see here. Now we can use the same effect for exoplanets. And you're probably already thinking about, yeah, but we need a very specific aligned orbit. So the star, the planet needs to rotate exactly in our line of sight. And that is true. That is just a bias we have, and that is something, a risk we have to take, basically. So when we observe a star, we can only find the planet with a transit method if we, the planet, and the star are perfectly aligned in one line. Um, but luckily, if we look at enough stars, we actually find enough planets. So what happens is, you can see here, the planet travels in front of the star and it blocks some parts of the star. And that means if you measure the brightness of the star, it's a, a teeny bit less bright than it was before. Um, now, of course, the bigger the planet, the larger the dip in brightness. So the darker the star becomes and the easier we can find it. And that is exactly the reason why we, all, why we need all these space telescopes, why we need those fancy instrumentation, because the planets we are most interested in, and which I will talk at the end of my presentation, are the terrestrial one, like planets similar to Earth. But Earth is very, very small. And the signal it would make with our sun is extremely faint and barely detectable. So we need very good instrumentation to detect the, those very, uh, to find those planets, first off. And characterizing them, we need even better instrumentation. We need to go even further than that. But yeah, uh, the Kepler mission I talked to before was actually did exactly that. It just looked at the very dense field of stars, tried to analyze them all, looked for exactly this behavior, looked for exactly this dip 
in brightness, and with it, uh, they found thousands of exoplanets in a very narrow field um, on the sky. Uh, yes. Now, let me continue to a third method, which doesn't bring us that many exoplanets, to be honest, but I think it's a very fascinating way because that might be how you first imagined we are going for exoplanets. And I think it is very nice to know that if we are lucky and if we are very, very um, smart about it, we actually have ways to make images of, or to directly find those planets. And again, let me directly skip to the, how it looks like. So that is now, compared to the other two that we had were artist's impression to illustrate it. This is now a real image from a real uh, system. It's called HR8799. Again, one of those beautiful uh, names astrophysicists have for all the objects out there. And in this image, you can actually see four planets. Um, I mean, it's no little hard. Sometimes people only see like three of them. But if you look, if you count to four, you probably will find them. There's one very much uh, to the left. Then there's another one to the top and two to the bottom right. And fascinating about that is all the other techniques I showed you so far, we did actually not measure the planet directly. We measured the star. And from changes within the star, we realized that, hey, there needs to be a planet to explain those changes within the star. Now, with direct imaging, it's the opposite. We actually, again, I mean, you can see it a little bit. There's like this black dot in the middle, where very similar to the first picture I showed you of PDS-70, the circumstellar disk, we actually block out the light of the star. And then we, um, yeah, we need to be still, we need, there's a lot of work to be done before you can see them. But basically, you block the light, you process the images, and you will find the exoplanets, which... It's very fascinating because that means we actually have images, direct images of exoplanets. Now, this technique is, is quite difficult because of two reasons. We need to actually find them to get the resolution needed to find that is incredibly difficult. So we need huge telescopes because the bigger the telescope, the better the resolution. Sometimes hold true for cameras as well. If you go with your phone camera, you will not have the best images, but if you have a bigger camera, you have bigger pictures. Very similar with telescopes. Now, the second problem is those planets are actually very, very faint. Thus, the title of the slide. It is similar to trying to find a firefly next to a lighthouse, which, of course, the firefly has its own light, and it's, if the lighthouse would be gone, it would be very easy to detect but the lighthouse is just over brightening everything around it and it's basically impossible to see on its own. So what we need to do is, as the lighthouse does on its own, we need to block the light so we can actually see the firefly. And that is how we do those images. Now, let me talk a little bit about the success of those missions, which again, success can be defined in various ways. So here you can actually see um, a graph of the exoplanets we have found. Now, two things I found here very astonishing. First off, just look to the left. We are talking thousands of exoplanets. And that is just something that happens, you can see, over the last 20 years. After we started to detect the first exoplanets, um, which also were a little bit uh, controversial at that time, to something we found today on a regular basis. The second thing you can see is the technique used. So as you can see, radial velocity in the early days, a very nice technique to find exoplanets. Um, but since the takeoff of transits, that is the one that actually delivered um, this sheer number of exoplanets. Again, mostly due to missions um, to Kepler and similar missions where they uh, found thousands of exoplanets in a very short period of time. The third thing you can see that radial velocity and transit absolutely dominates the number of exoplanets found, and everything else are actually uh, only a few exoplanets have been found. Uh, and the last thing you can see, there's a whole list of other techniques, but as you see, those are um, not techniques that we will find many exoplanets, but all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. And depending on how much you follow uh, science and exoplanet news, you might have heard of one or the other technique, uh, because sometimes there are like very interesting dis uh, discoveries which were only possible with those. But for most parts, we will see radial velocity and transit measurements. Now, what have we learned 
from those observations. And one of the most uh, summarizing graphs I know is this one here, where on the left side, you can see the planet mass. So how heavy a planet is in comparison to Earth. So at one, at the very bottom, you see one Earth mass. So that is equally as heavy as we are. Um, and then it goes up and up and up. And a little bit below a thousand Earth mass, you see Jupiter hanging around on the right side, if you look within the graph. So that is roughly the, the, the mass of Jupiter. And then it still goes a little bit further up. Now, at one point, of course, if you go uh, very high, then you would reach stars, because uh, if you get too massive, then at one point you're basically forming a star. But here we are still in the planetary region. Now, on the, uh, on the hor horizontal axis, you see orbital distance, where we are on the left side, we are very, very close to the, to the host star. For us, it would be the sun, but for exoplanets, it's whatever they start, they're rotating. And on the right side, we are very far out. And now you can already see some patterns here. First off, um, oh yeah, exactly. We have the terrestrial planets. Those are the rocky ones where we can actually stand on, where uh, in science fiction, we actually could travel and set our food and which we can conquer. Um, higher up, we see Jupiters. And to the left, we see hot Jupiters. So those are kind of the, the most talked about planets. Now, terrestrial planets, I already gave you a short definition. It's basically uh, planets that have a rocky crust and that are solid. And they are usually uh, less in mass. So they are around Earth, Venus, but they can also be heavier. So they can also go up a little bit of mass. Now, if you look, but if you look on it, like after like 10 Earth masses, we only see like uh, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter from the solar system, which are all gaseous planets. And that is the truth basically for all the planets up there. If they are very heavy, then they're very, then they're probably gaseous. Um, to the left, we have the, as I mentioned before, the hot Jupiters, which are called that way because they're so close to the star that you can actually get heated to a very uh, extreme amount and are very ob uh, interesting objects to study in itself. Now, if you look at this graph without any prior knowledge, you would think, wow, there are much more gas planets out there than there ever will be terrestrial planets. But that is actually not 100% not the truth, because what you need to be aware, we have the bottom right of the, of the graph, where we have absolutely no exoplanets. We only know the planets in our solar system, but that is not because they don't exist. It's just that small planets on large orbits are very difficult to detect. Now you can already see like depending on a te technique, it is a little bit easier. For example, to the left, we see a lot of uh, transits, which are very good for short orbits um, and a little bit better for high masses. We see the Doppler techniques, which broaden a little bit more um, over the whole range. And then to the very right, you see actually direct imaging. The orange points are direct imaging planets. So that shows us that, already shows us the need for those different techniques because they are differently good in different regimes. And with direct imaging, we are able to find planets very far out, but not very small planets. So overall, we have this little triangle on the bottom, which probably there are many, many exoplanets there, but we have not found them yet. So that, again, is why we need better instrumentation to further push that triangle down and really go into the regime where it becomes interesting, where we can find terrestrial planets on Earth-like orbits, which I don't think I need to convince you would be very cool to find and even cooler to study. Good. With that, we have um, a very broad summary about how our, how our planets form, where do they come from, how do we find these exoplanets, and what is some basic knowledge we already have, like the distribution, like the statistics of those planets? So with that, um, oh, ah, I forgot this slide. Perfect. So we have here uh, all these different planets. And as I mentioned before, we have the terrestrial planets, which are very much of interest. And since we're here in Belgium, um, at least for everyone joining in from Belgium, for everyone else, I hope it's interesting for you as well. We have one very fascinating system, and it's called the TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, again, for the Belgium, uh, yes, that name really comes from the beer um, because astrophysicists have a habit of making very cool acronyms, even though they get um, a little bit creative at the end. But what we have found out there is the TRAPPIST-1 system, and it's fascinating because there are seven known planets 
around it. And that is one of the very few systems where we actually know about a lot of planets, because we have eight. We have, uh, or nine, depending on your, uh, on your opinion on Pluto, but let's go with eight for the moment. Now, those are a lot of planets, but if we look for other planets, also because of that little uh, the detection bias of the further out smaller planets, we only know most systems with like one, two, or three planets maybe, and very few with more. But the TRAPPIST-1 system is one where we actually have seven planets. Um, you can already see the host star is much smaller than the sun, so the planets are also much further in. Uh, on the bottom, you can see actually a comparison between the two systems where all those seven planets are actually closer to uh, the star than Mercury is in our system, so they're very close to it. Now, but because the sun or the star, where the, the star of the TRAPPIST-1 system is also smaller, that means that actually um, some of those seven planets are in a, in a distance to the star where, similar to Earth, it allows for liquid water. And you can already imagine, water is very much connected with life. So whenever we find something that could possibly have water on it, we get a little excited and we want to learn more about those planets. So that is why TRAPPIST-1 is one uh, of the most fascinating systems we found so far uh, and is um, subject to intense studies because we hope to learn a lot from it. So now, that is a very good bridge to the last topic I have. What about life? Because I'm perfectly aware, everything I showed you so far um, is, I hope for you, very interesting, because after all, you uh, tuned into a talk about exoplanets, so I figured it would be very interesting for you. But one question that is literally, I think, on everyone's mind is, what about life outside Earth? What about the aliens? Where are they? How do we find them? What, do we, what they're doing out there? And Kind of as a last part of this presentation, I want to give you a little bit of a scientific view on how we approach this topic and what are some very important factors to it, so that after this presentation, you know a little bit more about what it means to look for life in a scientific way and not just looking for whatever shoots a railgun at us. The first difficulty that we have, and I know it sounds a little bit strange, but is how to, do we define life? What is the definition of life? Of course, here on Earth, it's very simple. I mean, you see a cat walking by and you say like, yeah, that's definitely alive. Then you see yourself and you think like, oh yeah, that's definitely alive as well. But then it gets a little complicated. For example, a very good example right now, the coronavirus. It is a virus, but is a virus alive? because it has some characteristics of life, but it doesn't have other. It cannot reproduce itself. It needs us to do the job for it. Is this life? Is this just something, an appendix to us? Is that something that defines on us? And people are not really 100% on the same page on this topic. So there are different possibilities. Now, let me show you some definitions that are used often. First off, you know the biology textbook definition, where we have exhibiting all or most of the following traits, where we have organization, metabolism, growth, adaptation, reactions, reproduction, and homostasis, which is just a given list of properties that it has, but you already see it's all or most. So it's a very lenient definition of what life is and what it's not. Um, because, it, yeah, we know animals that we would consider to be life, which may or may not, we have some variation on those different traits. So you can already see biology textbooks, they try to make a good job, but they already kind of admit that it's very hard. Now, a very bad thing, but nevertheless it happens, is to ask a physicist about the definition of life, because even though we're not experts on it, we definitely have an opinion on it. And one definition that you can find in a lot of places is a local environment with an increase in order. Now that is very abstract and doesn't really help that much either. So let's go to the last definition, which NASA actually uses, which they call a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Now, I, just, I hope everyone knows what Darwinian evolution refers to, because unfortunately I don't have time to give a, a whole explanation to that. But it basically means just everything that goes through evolution, that um, evolves over time. Classical example of the giraffe, which develops a longer neck or... Um, other organisms that adapt to its environment over time and over generations. 
Now the question that I also want to ask on top of that is, why do we need to define life? Why is it important? And I think in the end, we want to know what are we looking for? And if we found something, how interesting is it? Because after all, yeah, we want to find space cats. That would be amazing. Something that we can really tell, hey, this is life out there. But probably during the course of uh, our research, space cats will not be the first thing we find. The first thing we probably will find are microbiological life, or even worse, just signs of those lives. So it's very hard to tell if that is already life or not. Um, some of you might uh, have seen there were already some discussion about possible detections of life. How much do they know? Is it really life? Is it not? So the discussion is very much ongoing. So what I want to give you on the way is my personal definition of life. Because how I define finding life on an exoplanet is just a complex system. And I know that is probably as bad as the physics definition, because after all, I'm a physicist. So yeah, you should have expected that. But what I mean by that is the first thing we will find out there on an exoplanet is something that we cannot explain without life as we know it. It is not sure that this is life or not. It could be something else. It could be something very, very interesting in its own without being life. But what, I, what we know for sure is it will be something so complex that we do not understand it right now or that is very hard to explain. And those are things that are very interesting to search for on exoplanets. So that is my definition since it's the most useful one for exoplanets. We are just looking at them and everything that is complex could potentially be life. It could be a life form that we don't know. So that is what we should look for and what we should research, even though it might not be life. Um, yeah, and probably the other one are a little better suited if you really want to find space cats. Now, the next thing is how do we actually look for life on those planets? And one idea that is currently the most favored one or the main way how researchers think we will look, uh, we will find life, they're called biomarkers. So those are things um, mostly um, given molecules, given substances in our atmosphere. Um, and with the current technology, what we can do is we can actually look at the light of a planet. So that's what you see here on the right. So on the bottom, you see the wavelength. So that is actually different colors of light, where we go from green to blue to red to colors we can't even see with our own eyes, because they're either far in the infrared or very far in the ultraviolet, usually more in the infrared for our, in our case. And within this light, we actually see signs of those different molecules, of those different species in the air. And you can see here some examples. For example, we can see traces of carbon dioxide on the very top. We see some patterns that we can attribute to water, or we can even find ozone. And if we have very good observations, again, coming back to the good, in, uh, the good telescopes we need, um, we can find more and more of these. And they are really helpful of finding life on exoplanets because as you see we have here three planets venus earth and mars and to the best of our knowledge only one of those three has life on it um, and if we look at the spectra we see venus and mars basically having a very flat spectra not much going on except a lot of co2 so we know those planets have a lot of co2 but not much more now if you look at earth we see a much more rich spectra and we see elements that are very, um, very much more complex, very more, uh, require much more, um, a much bigger system and a much more complex system to actually occur. For example, ozone, which is there. And that, I mean, you can already see, maybe it's a sign of life, but we, we, we need to be always careful because there might be other explanation for ozone other than life. So if we look at the even larger spectra and even more molecules, we see there are many uh, possible candidates for called biomarkers, so things that we find them in those spectra. We have no explanation other than life. But that does not directly mean that we will have found life when we found those signatures, because there might be an explanation that we did not know. Or there might be forms of life that we did not know uh, existed because they are so different from what we know on Earth. So overall, you can see it's a very complicated topic and it's very hard to go from, 
hey, today, to yesterday we didn't know aliens existed, to tomorrow we are 100% sure they're out there. That's probably not going to happen. What's going to happen is we will have very, uh, very small hints about, hey, there could be something interesting that could be explained with life, and then we need to study it in great detail to actually be certain that there is life on those planets. So that will be a very long process. Now, the next problem, as I already hinted a little bit at it, is the signals are very, very faint. They are, I mean, those planets are very nice to study because they're our neighbors, so we can actually go there and we can have very detailed observation. We cannot do that with exoplanets. You already saw, like, we need creative ways to finding them, and the ways to analyze them are as e equally as creative as finding them, and it gets more and more difficult with the amount of information you want to have from an exoplanet. So we need very good technology, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched, to even to get further in, um, in our knowledge, to get further in the data so we have better data, so we can really pick up these very faint signals that probably will hint on life or may not. Only future can tell. Now, yeah, as I mentioned, those are basically the telescopes. Um, you already saw the space telescopes um, that were built, but there are also some ground telescopes, and I quickly want to throw in here a picture of um, the Speculus telescope. Uh, because again, the Belgians have a habit of naming things very fantastically. And they, need, they needed to get very creative to have like a scientific name and end up with speculus. But those are all the things that are built to actually increase our knowledge about exoplanets, to get to know them better and better. Yeah, and with that I quickly want to summarize again the life part, because I think the most important thing for you to remember is that we will not find life on an exoplanet in a day, and we will not find space cats immediately. It will be a prolonged process. We will slowly increase our knowledge. We will learn more and more about possible other life forms, how they could be out there. We will get more, uh, more and better data on exoplanets. And with all of that, maybe at some point, we will have a planet out there that is so complex, so interesting, and we cannot find anything other explanation than there has to be life there. We don't know yet what kind of life there will be. We don't know yet what forms it will take. Will it be intelligent? Will it not? Only time will tell. But for us, for sure, it will be a prolonged process, which will take a lot of time, which need to carefully be checked and checked and reviewed before we are really sure what's going on. Good. And with that, um, again, I really want to quickly run over what we did today. We looked at where do stars and planets come from? What do we know about them? How many have we found? Uh, what type have we found? To what can we expect to find on them? And with this, I want to thank you all for tuning in, for listening to me, and I really hope you got, you improved your knowledge about exoplanets, you saw some amazing pictures, and you know now a little bit better what we already know about exoplanets and what there will be to, uh, what we will uh, expect in the coming years. So thank you for your attention and have a great day.